we, we want to um, um, continue with this idea, the life of Abraham. And in particular, as we look at Abraham, the thing that is tough to me about Abraham, um, we are creature, we, we live in the microwave age, you know. And it, it has to do with how you live. It has to do with your culture. I remember Ramona and I left a fairly large city to pastor a little community of about uh, 5,000 people. And I knew we had been there uh, a long time when uh, we started just ranting and raving because we had to wait for two cars at the flashing red light, you know. To, Place is getting too big, you know. We had, we had to wait for two cars. Um, we looked at each other and laughed. We 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 be, we become a product of what we live in, and we are in an age of instant potatoes, instant this, instant that. We uh, uh, our meals as often as not are are we we. You know, how many seconds do you punch into the microwave? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just, I'm saying that we've got to understand that um, as we begin our walk with God and seek the Lord to bring us to maturity, we've got to understand that um, God um, understands seasons and atmospheres. God understands that. But there are some things that God seems to be absolutely non-negotiable on. And it's things like our character. Um, and I, I, I have tried my best to help God with this. But he doesn't seem to understand time. You know, I've tried to help him. But uh, he's, he's either a slow learner or I'm a bad teacher. I don't know what it is. And for those of you that are visiting tonight, I am teasing. I know that God doesn't need any of my help. But um, um, I, I, I am amazed at how God deals with us. And it seems like he's just absolutely oblivious to time. Um, Abraham's story really stands out because you've got, you know, chapter 1 and chapter 2 that cover, we don't know how long, before there was a planet Earth, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in chapter 1, we don't know how many years that involved. Now you say, well, we know it was just, it was six days. Well, I'm not, I'm not talking about just creation. I'm talking about God's, I mean, of, of the earth. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the whole cosmos. We, we just, we don't understand what he's dealing with. And then he takes a little break in chapter 3 to explain the introduction of sin. And then when we get to chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it's, it's these massive periods of time. And it's the year, uh, I mean, it's the uh, flood that, that took up months, and God's just blowing past these things in chapter 10 and 11. And then all of a sudden, he puts the brakes on. He puts the brakes on, and he says, now, you know, you ever thought about the genealogies that we read in Matthew? So-and-so begot so-and-so, and he lived 680 years. So-and-so begot so-and-so, and he lived 963 years. You know, and, and centuries are just zipping by. And then God puts his foot on the brake. Just puts his foot on the brake and says, now let me tell you about a man. And beginning in chapter 12 or the end of chapter 11, God begins to deal with us and tell us the story of Abraham. Um, the story, Abraham's story is going to cover about 100 years although we don't have much detail about the last uh, oh, 60 or 70 years of his life. Um, um, and and you've got to remember, he was an old man when we met him. He was already an old man. And I, every time I read it, it, just, it seems like the older I get, the more it stands out to me. God says, I am going to bless you. I'm going to give you an un unimaginable blessing. 
And Abraham says, great. And what does God do? Waits 25 years. So he comes to Abram and says, now, Abraham, don't be discouraged. I haven't forgotten my promise. What I'm going to do for you, I promise you I'm going to do. And then what does God do? Six years later, Abraham's asking the question again. Then you think he's really heard from God this time. All the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Now we've got it. Oh, everything's filled in. So what does God do? He waits another 17 years. God has an invaluable tool in his tool chest that we just don't, we just don't get it. I don't get it. You don't get it. None of us get it. We say yes. We say amen. We laugh, but we just don't get it. God has this refining tool called time that he uses to define our faith, to refine our faith. To, um, um, to do what can't otherwise be accomplished. That's why in Galatians it says, in the fullness of time. That little phrase is loaded, in the fullness of time. That means when everything that needed to happen had been fulfilled and every potentiality was at its, uh, just, just loaded for fulfillment. In the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those of us that are under the law in order to give us the, the adoption and the, 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 uh, of sons and, as sons and citizenship in his kingdom. That, it, it's, a, it's a loaded phrase, the fullness of time. Now, um, it's hard for us to deal with time. I quote this a lot, and those of you that have been here a long time, forgive me, I'm doing it for all the all of our newer families. But um, uh, the book of James in the Phillips translation probably um, gives us a clearer understanding than, than most other passages and, and than a lot of translations. It says this, my brothers and sisters, when difficulty, frustrations, and trials come into your life, I wonder how many of us would say, when difficulties, frustrations, and trials come into your life, he says something that makes me want to just slap him. He says, do not resent them as intruders. Can I tell you the truth? There's a lot of stuff that I resent. It slows me down. It robs my joy. He says, do not resent them as intruders. What does he tell us to do? Welcome them as friends. It wouldn't be so bad if James had just said, don't resent them as intruders, but just buck up and be strong and just realize that's life. No, he, that's not enough for James. <laughs> James doesn't say, you know, I understand and it's tough, but, but just, just, just try to have a little bit. Just, you know... Sing a verse of nobody knows the trouble I've seen and then just know it'll be over in a while. No, he says when you get God's perspective, you shift from resenting what's happening to you to embracing it as a friend. To embracing it as a friend. That's not as easy as it sounds. And, and one of the reasons we get so nervous about it is we know that God is going to use time. He's going to use time. Um, the scripture says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Now, you remember what after these things were. You remember these things? That was this fight that Abraham had. He's an old man and he leads a fight to rescue his nephew Lot and his family and all the inhabitants of the cities of the plain. And Abraham's thinking, you know, I mean, possibly, I'm too old for this. God, you've given me a promise and, you know, this kind of life is for young men, not for me. And, and it was a violent age. It was a vicious age. And it's after these things, the Lord comes to him in a vision and says, do not fear Abram. 
I am a shield to you. I don't know why he would say that if Abram wasn't struggling with how secure am I? Um, your reward shall be very great. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Now Eliezer was a great guy and the custom of the land was if you don't have a child, the manager of your household is to be treated like your child and they inherit everything. Um, and Abram said, since you have, uh, yeah, and Abram said, since you've given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir. Now Eliezer is a great guy. We're going to read about how he got a wife for Isaac. And he's a great guy. But God says, this man is not going to be your heir. But one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Um, and he took him outside. And the, and the Hebrew word, a lot of scholars, it's, it's, it's the idea of being snatched up. It's, it's like, uh, we're, we're not sure, but it's like God just transported him outside. I mean, it's a real supernatural moment. He took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens. Count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he um, believed the Lord and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? Now I want to interrupt myself right here to say this. I, I think we've been taught some unfortunate things in recent years. One is like uh, if you ever ask for something twice, you're asking an unbelief. Uh, that's, that's not theologically correct and it's not healthy. It's not healthy to let Christians think that they're in sin if they struggle. Um, he said, how will I know that I may possess it? You know, my, my philosophy of prayer is push, you know, P-U-S-H, pray until something happens. Um, there, there's nothing wrong with, with continuing to pray until the job's done. Jesus even healed a blind man twice because one touch only brought him part way. There was no lack in Jesus. There, we don't know if there were divine reasons for that or if the man didn't believe or we don't know. But Jesus just said, you know, you wouldn't see men as trees walking if you had faith. Jesus just touched him again, you know. Um, so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, and he cut them in two, and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Um, I, I just want to say this. I, don't, I know we don't allegorize the Scripture, but I think Abraham just did something that we need to hear, and it was this. Abraham had to drive the birds of prey away, and I think what we need to pick up from that. I don't think this is a doctrinal point. I just think it's an observation. God is so unconcerned with time from our perspective that even the sacrifices we bring to Him, it seems like it takes so long for God to do something that we got to chase vultures away. Now the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers. I, I, I'm, I just got to say this. I'm afraid I'll forget it. I feel the Holy Spirit prompting my heart. Um, one of the toughest things that we may need to understand as we begin to really walk in deeper intercession with the Lord is this idea of uh, sometimes we have a sense of dread or fear um, and if we're not careful, we will begin to interpret that sense of dread or fear as God's gonna, God says something bad's going to happen or God's, God's abandoned me. 
And I think that sometimes we need to understand that um, when God allows those kind of feelings to come to us, uh, the vast majority of the time, in my opinion, it's not God saying, Justin, you're in deep trouble, boy. It's God showing Justin something about the battle. Or it's something God wants him to pray against. You know, if you have a dream that you feel it's from the Lord and someone you love is hurt, don't go into despair saying, oh my, they're going to be in a wreck, they're going to be hurt. Pray against that. God shows you that, I, I believe, to pray against it. Um, my, I had a, an uncle that uh, was, was murdered at a very young age. I think he was like, had just turned or about to turn 40. He was murdered and he had lived a pretty rough life. And uh, his mother told me, his relative of mine, she said every time he got in trouble, whether it was a wreck or whatever, been in prison, all kinds of things, she said every time, every time that the, uh, he was in a, a wreck or a dangerous place, the Lord showed it to me in a dream the night before. But the Lord showed me nothing. She said, why wouldn't the Lord show me about this that was about to happen? And I didn't know. I was a teenager. I didn't have any answer for her. I said, you know, I don't know. And I'm so thankful that it was a couple of years later. She said, you know, the Lord, I, 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 we were talking. I asked her if she ever figured that out. She said, oh, yeah. She said, the Lord told me I was operating from a wrong theology. And I said, I, I don't understand. She said, all my life I've lived in fear that when I dreamed something or the Lord showed me something, I lived in fear that this was about to happen to somebody I loved. And um, she said, the Lord showed me that every time he showed me an, a, an instance, it was for me to pray against that so it would not happen. And she said, it sounds horrible, but the, the Lord said the reason he didn't show me about this last incident with my son's life is it was time for him to come home. And he didn't want me praying against his purposes. Well, that's still pretty heavy duty, and I, it's, it's something you still have to process. But Abram had this deep sleep, and terror and great darkness fell upon him. And, and here's the reason for it, I, I believe. It says, God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. That was the reason for the, the terror that Abraham felt. God said, I want you to understand, I'm about to do something phenomenal with your family, but there's going to be some dark days before the phenomenal happens. He said, I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. Now we know it to be Egypt. And afterward they will come out with many possessions, which is exactly what happened. As you go, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. See, he's been this, this battle that he just came out of is looming in his mind. So God says, I'm your shield. I'm going to take care of you. And you're going to live to be an old man. Now he's already talking to, you know, he's already an old man by our standards. He's probably already bankrupted his social security account. And you're going to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, I, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm doing too much interrupting tonight. But there's a rabbinical writing where every Jewish man prayed that when it was time for him to die, he would die um, in his own bed and that his children would be there to close his eyes. That's, that's what's, that kind of thing is what God is talking about to him. Then in the fourth generation they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now there's something else about the sovereignty of God. See God didn't just drive out all of the nations of Canaan and say you know you're out of here I'm bringing Israel in. God had been working to bring those nations in Canaan to a place of repentance. And what he said to Abram, he said, you know, why 400 years? Because there's still a chance for the Amorites. There's still a chance for them. Everybody else, the cup is full. But there's still a chance for the Amorites. And he said, it'll be 400 years 
before that cup is full. See, God knew they weren't going to respond. And God knew that they would walk into judgment. But God in his kindness said, I've got to exhaust every chance that I, that I can for them. So he said 400 years. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between those pieces that had been cut up. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your generations or, or to your descendants, um, I have given this land. And then he describes the land. And when it talks about the torch and the oven and the thing moving between the sacrifices, in the past I've illustrated this with, with Justin. The way you made covenant is you cut up the animals. The only animals you didn't cut up were birds because they were just so small. But you would cut the animals in half, you would arrange them, and then the two covenant partners would walk in a figure eight uh, from one end to the other. They would meet in the middle and um, they would, they didn't shake hands, but they would do this. And um, then they would come back and usually they would put their, their hand, uh, um, some of the writings have a person putting their hand under their own thigh. Others say uh, examples were putting, they put each other's hands under the other person's thigh. Now that sounds like something kind of out of Saturday Night Live. But, um, <laughs> which I don't watch. No, I don't watch. Uh, but but this, is, this is the biggest muscle in your body. The, th the thigh is the biggest muscle in your body. And when you put your hand under your thigh or, the, or, or two that were agreeing in covenant, put their hands under the thighs of the others, what they were saying is this, as long as my strength lasts, it, with every ounce of strength that I have, I will keep the covenant that I'm making with you now. And there was another implication. They're walking between these, this, these cut up animals. And the, and the other implication was this. May the same thing that happened to these animals happen to me if I don't keep covenant with you. They took covenant very seriously. You know, have you ever given your sweetheart one of those necklaces? Oh, I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't say it. Because I did it and... and, and when I found out what it meant, my wife just said, you've ruined a perfectly good romantic moment, big boy. You've ruined it. But you know, you had the two, the, the two heart, the two halves, and then you have, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are apart. <laughs> I want to tell you, that was a curse. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't, oh, darling, I'm going out of town for a week of business. The Lord watched between us. It was covenant language. It was saying this, while we're apart, you better keep your end of the deal or God will see it and he'll fry you like sausage. She, she threw it away. She threw it away. Here's, here's the central idea of what we're behind. God requires us to live by faith. He requires it. But faith isn't blind. You know, we talk about blind faith. True faith is not blind, and it's not one-dimensional. Um, we, we have a tendency to think of faith as me believing God and me pleasing Him and me jumping through the hoops. And, you know, if I'm going to have, if I'm going to get anything from God, I've got to have faith. But the, the Scripture, and this is New Testament theology, the Scripture makes it clear, even if we don't prove ourselves faithful, God is so committed to the covenant that He the scripture says, cannot deny himself, he will remain faithful. Now there are some, there are some commands that God makes for us. Am, am I, are, are you following me okay here? I'm trying to, to, I'm trying to cover a lot up front. Um, uh, there are some commands that God makes that are conditional. I mean, they are conditional. They depend on us. You know, if you want to enjoy the good of the promised land, God said to Israel, keep my commandments. You know, honor your father and your mother so that your days in the land will be long, you know. He says, if you want to stay in the land, you've got to do this. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is written as a legal document. And God said, if you keep my word, this will happen. But if you don't, this will happen. There were a lot of conditions, maybe I should say it this way, a lot of conditional promises 
that God made. They're all in the Bible. They're all in the Bible. But there's a handful of unconditional promises. And the covenant that God made with Abraham that night was unconditional. See, what was supposed to happen, um, Justin, let's show them again. You're at this end of the, the animal. The animal's cut into pieces. Now, what's supposed to happen is we declare the terms of the covenant and then we start walking in a figure eight, okay? We meet in the middle and we swear that the covenant will be kept. Now, we're going to skip the leg part okay. tonight. We, and then we go, we, go to the other, we go to the other end, okay? And then we come back. We do it again. And uh, this is where we would normally stop and, and grab the thigh, but we're not going to do that. But you know what God did on this covenant event? Abraham, Abraham's job was to drive away the, the, the birds of prey. Abraham's been waiting, and he's been waiting, and he's been waiting. And God does the unthinkable. Abraham, because this is the way they did business all the time. Abraham knew exactly what was going on when he prepared the sacrifice. He knew he was about to walk this covenant with God. But God doesn't let Abraham move a step. God, it's as though God says, you stand there. And God walks the covenant himself. He walks it himself. And can you imagine Abraham when God in that form came right next to him? And what did God do? God turned and he started walking back. And you know what God was saying? He said, Abraham, I'm going to do this and it will not depend on your faithfulness. Now, now, church, don't misunderstand me. There's a lot of the Christian life that depends on our faithfulness. There's a lot of the Christian life that depends on our obedience. But God was saying to Abraham, he said, there are some things I'm going to do for you I, and I give you my word that no matter what transpires, this is going to happen. And that's why Paul, with such confidence, said, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. That's why he said, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that everything I commit to him, he is able to keep. Um, we're not Calvinists. We don't believe in unconditional eternal security but I want to tell you something. Um, we need to understand how secure we are as believers. And we need to understand, um, I think the average Assembly of God church says that we're saved by grace and then we stay saved by our works. And that's not right. Um, I, I want you to understand, uh, you are in His hand. And if you're really a Christian, if you're really a Christian, and, now, you know, you say, well, I've known people that backslid and didn't serve the Lord. Well, I, I wonder if they have, you know, there's a lot of times people uh, make a profession, but they don't make a commitment. There's a lot of times people express, a, a, you know, I, I know, I know the, the number, I mean, I've been a pastor for a long time, and I know this, the number of conversions is directly proportional to how much trouble somebody's in. You know, uh, I've had people, I swear if God will help me with this, you know, no, no, no. I'm, I'm not talking about people that want relief. I'm talking about people that want release. When we really commit ourselves to Him, God makes this promise that He is going to be the one walking the covenant. Now, don't worry. I, I, I do believe there's a thing called apostasy. I do believe that. And I do believe that, like I said, much of the Christian life is about our obedience and is about our conformity to His will. That's why God promised us, and it's one of those wonderful promises, He said, I'll promise you the woodshed. If you don't live right, I will chastise you. I will correct you. I will discipline you. He said that's such a normal part of the life. He said, understand this. He said, um, no, you've done the prayer already, right? Okay. I'm sorry. We, on Wednesday nights we have so many things going. I missed the first part. I apologize. Um, uh, God, you know, God said, you need to understand that, that my correction is such a normal part of the Christian life. He said, if you don't ever get corrected and taken to the woodshed, he said, you, you need to stop and, and ask the question, am I really saved at all? 
I, I, one, of, one of my kids, I won't say uh, which one, but uh, he, he had a rough couple of years in junior high. <laughs> oh, Jesus help us. He had a rough couple of years in junior high. And I got called in one day uh, from the, the dean of students, said, Mr. Chitty, I hate to bother you, but so-and-so, well, I have to, I'll tell you who it was. It was Joey, because I have to tell you the name in order to tell the story. But uh, uh, he said, Joey's, Joey's had a problem, and I need you to come in. He says, nothing, nothing earth-shattering, but he, we, we tried to work with him, and I, I just need a daddy. And I said, I'll be there, and I went in, and sitting in the, the dean's office and all the secretaries were there and it was just, you know, just a friendly group of people. And did you ever see in the program Cheers when Norm walks in, everybody says, Norm! You know? And uh, my son walks in and everybody says, Joey! <laughs> and he went over and he had a coffee cup that he was in there so much he had a coffee cup. His own coffee cup. Well, we, got, we worked it out, and Joey worked it out, and he's a school teacher today reaping what he sowed probably. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of him. But you know what? Um, God says that's the way it's going to be. If, if you're my child, you're going to be corrected. And he said, don't be afraid. If you get corrected so much, you have your own coffee cup. Just keep coming in. Because he said it's a sign of his love. Now, um, we, we, we've, set the, we've set the stage, the outline. I, I just need to touch a couple of things. The, after these things, remember his journey. He left Ur of the Chaldeans and stopped in Haran. Uh, he was told to leave his father and his family, but he took some, his father and family with him. And it, it could be, we don't know, but it could be, God might have just been speaking in the ultimate sense. You know, you're going to take a journey that you're going to end up making it without your family. It, it could be that he didn't disobey God. It could have been that God was speaking in the big process. You're going to leave your father. But we do know that he stayed in a city that was the twin city of Ur, uh, the city of Haran. He stayed there until his father died. And it was several years he was there. So his father had to die before he moves on. He meets the test of the famine and he runs to Egypt. He survives Egypt and learns lessons there. He then begins to build altars. And then there was the fiasco with Lot and, uh, the, and Abraham's greatness as it's shown. Um, but Abraham was struggling with these insecurities. And God comes to him and gives him reassurance. He was struggling with security and he was struggling because God promised him a son and he had not had a son. Um, and, and guys, I don't, I don't mean to talk down to anybody, but um, my wife and I know the struggle with infertility. We, we know what it's like um, to go for years being told you'll never have children and what that does to you. And, 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 and Abraham lived in a culture, we have writings from Old Testament era uh, now, please don't be offended by this if, you're, if, if you don't have children. This, I'm, I'm telling you what they were up against. A woman was considered a waste of space because if she didn't bear children, she was considered to not be carrying her share of the load. Food was going to somebody that was non-productive. And women were thought to be cursed if they didn't have children. Now, that's, that's horrible. That's not what the Bible teaches, but that's what that culture taught. And, I, it, and it grieves me to even say that because I know, I know what Ramona and I went through all those years, uh, having what we felt was a promise, but then, <laughs> then the promise not, not being fulfilled. Now, that's what they were dealing with. He, he needed a son. He needed security. And uh, there's a little description of God. Abraham prays and says, O oh Lord God. It's a combination of Adonai and Yahweh, Master and Lord. Another translation is Sovereign Lord. He's not just a God anymore to Abraham. And he's not just the God who appeared to me. Now he is Sovereign Lord. Abraham understands that he is the only true God. And, uh, you know, he says, 
you know, you tell me you're my shield and you tell me that you're going to give me this land, but you have not, you've not kept your end of the deal. Um, and, and can I tell you, when Abraham died, the only thing he owned was a couple of cemetery plots. That's all he owned when he died. And he says, Lord, I love Eliezer, but he's not mine. How do, you, how do you explain this? And God flatly rejects the cultural assumption <clears throat> that Abraham had concerning Eliezer. <coughs> God takes him outside. God shows him the stars. And it says, oh, God is saying, Abraham, I've got this. I've got this. And Abraham's amazing response, if you're following there on the outline in verse 6, it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, <coughs> we don't know all the specifics of his journey, but we know at this point something was understood by Abram that may not have been fully grasped before. I don't mean to imply that Abraham wasn't a believer. I don't believe that at all. He had been building altars. He had been worshiping. But I want to encourage you to expect plateaus, or maybe plateaus is not the right word, but understand that your understanding of God may come in journeys and in steps. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I remember I used to say, Lord, how could I have been so blind? How could I have served you all these years and not understood this? Well, we have, well I call them Abraham moments. Your crisis brings you to a point where you now begin to understand something about God that you didn't understand before. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3. He said, I've, I've counted the loss of all things and I'm persevering. He said, King James says that I might win Christ. Now that sounds strange because, I mean, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about a dead person raising apostle. He says, I'm doing this that I might win Christ. It doesn't make any sense until you understand in King James' day, the word win was used of minors. <coughs> and, and for 250 years after that, in England, when a miner descended into a cave or into a mine, he would go to get coal or a metal or whatever it was. And what they said they were doing, they were going to win the coal. Um, what did they mean? It's there. I'm going to dig it out. And I think that that's maybe the best way to explain our life with Christ. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't have for us. You know what it's like to get in the altar and you see somebody and, and uh, you, you say, oh, God must be doing something in them. And they just keep praying, they keep praying. It, well, so many times, and I, I love this about the culture I grew up in, we called it tarrying services. You'd get in the altar and you'd see somebody pray and pray and it wasn't that they didn't believe. But you know what? They were going to a new level and they were digging it out. Uh, you would go in the altar and you'd say, I know this is in Jesus. I know this peace that I need is in Jesus. I know this victory that I need is in Jesus. I know this new level of faith or understanding, whatever I need, it's in Jesus. But you didn't just confess it and let somebody whack you on the head. You dug it out. It was the mindset, I'm going to win Christ. He's mine, but all oh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And the only way we get it is by digging it out. That's what was happening with Abraham. He believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And Levens, I, I, I could do a whole lesson on this, but in, you've got the scriptures there in Romans 4, uh, in, in, a, in about uh, five verses, Galatians 6, James 2, 23. What happened to Abraham in this chapter is what the New Testament writers use to describe what it means to be born again. Righteousness comes from believing God. And Abraham believed him. Uh, I talked to you about the east side years, my, my home church, where I know when I got saved, I was as saved as I could ever be. But I'm so thankful for that old-fashioned Pentecostal church I grew up in 
where we were encouraged, you, if you need something from God, bring it to the altar. Bring it to the altar. Spread this thing out before the Lord. And my pastor did such a masterful job of, of the whole emphasis of his ministry was get in these altars. Get in these altars. Let's pray. You know, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was a uh, he helped me so much. One lady was wiggling my throat. And you, you, should, and you can't pray when somebody's grabbed your golly hopper and wiggling it. And one was saying, turn loose. And another one saying, hold on. And I buried my face. And another one said, look up. The Holy Ghost comes from above. And I'd look up and another one would say, don't have pride in your heart, son. You're approaching God. And, you know, it looked down. And I, it took me two weeks before I ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what I finally did I, I didn't even know this happened. My mom told me about it. I just kind of did a G.I. Joe crawl and got under the front pew where those ladies couldn't get to me. And I, don't even, I didn't know this happened, but when my pastor saw me doing it, my mom said he whacked me on the butt and said, Go get it, boy. Go get it. I, I didn't remember that. But he understood, he understood that these things, this growth in Jesus comes by our pressing in, by our pressing in. Um, you say, well, that doesn't sound very scriptural. Well, I read in Joshua today, Joshua spoke to the children of Israel when they were crossing the Jordan. He said, now when you see the ark move, this is what he said literally, go after it. Follow the ark into the river. Go after it. So my pastor was being very scriptural. I don't want you whacking people on the rear end, but... <laughs> I do want us to have the attitude, we're going to go after it. Well, we got to hurry here. We're almost out of time. Um, and God cut covenant. We talked about that. Abraham fell into this deep sleep. He receives an assurance of protection. He was 85 at this point. Now, he's going to live to be 175. Um, and he received a prophetic word about the future and about his descendants. And we talked last week about... Um, that God promised him a much larger area than Israel has ever had, but God's going to give it to him. The name of the lesson tonight is, is El Khalil. It's Arabic and it just means the friend. That in the Middle East is how Abraham is talked about most often, according to missiologists. They say he's the friend, the friend. The friend of God. Now here are the Christian life lessons. Oh, we've, we've got to hurry. I can't do these justice. But number one, God calms our fears and understands our questions. Uh, when we grow up with the mindset that we should never question God or never express what we feel, it, it, it's so counterproductive because I know this, um, I know I don't think anything meant more to my kids growing up than the knowledge that they could express to me their fears. They could talk to me about their frustrations. They could talk to me if they didn't think I was being fear, uh, fair. And, and, and God, is a, He's big enough to handle our fears and our frustrations. He understands them. And, and you got to stop and think how compassionate God is. He meets Abraham where he's at, which is a place of fear and uncertainty and disappointment. God didn't say, hey, when you can stop pouting and, and claim the promise, come on up and we'll talk. I'm so thankful God goes right where we are. He goes right where we are. Now, I do believe God responds to faith, but thank God that's not the only time he moves in my life. Uh, the second life lesson is God has an impeccable sense of timing. It's just frustrating, but it's perfect. It's perfect. Children of Israel go into the land. They've been eating manna for 40 years. They have Passover that hasn't been had. And it's like they wake up the next morning and uh, there's no manna, but there's provision from the land. God didn't allow the manna to last one day longer than it should have, but he didn't stop it one day too early. Oh, amazing, amazing. Number three, God wants us to trust him and remain at peace. We all know that, but I want to tell you, it's hard. It's difficult. I don't even know how to elaborate on that. It's just hard to remain at peace 
But I want to tell you, even when you're struggling with the idea of peace, God doesn't give up on you. He loves you and He carries you. Number four, God wants us to live without fear and turmoil. That's the will of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's talking about fear and turmoil. But of power and love and a sound mind. God wants us to live fear, uh, fear, free rather, of fear and turmoil. And number five, God has plans for our good, not for our destruction. Even when things don't look good, you know that precious promise, I, I know I'm repeating myself from a couple of weeks ago, but where Jeremiah said, uh, uh, God spoke through Jeremiah and said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a hope and a future, not, not calamity. Um, you got to remember, God gave that precious promise to the people of Israel. He gave that precious promise to them right after they were being taken into captivity. Everything looked horrible. But he said, remember the plans I have for you. Um, I told you, I guess my favorite verse in the Bible, there's a couple of them making a, a couple of verses that are challenging that right now. Um, but I, th I think probably my favorite verse in the Bible is the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. Oh God, there were years, probably decades, every morning I would sing that song. You know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, oh God. That's how I began every day. I got a new song now, but I don't know how long it'll last. But can I tell you something about my favorite verse and that phenomenal promise? It's from the saddest book in the Bible the book of Lamentations. It's Jeremiah weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem. And in that saddest of sad books, given on that saddest of sad days, and that, that book that offers such hope in the most hopeless of situations, God was saying through Jeremiah, listen, it doesn't matter what you're walking through right now. Tomorrow is a new day. And my steadfast love will always be there. My mercies will always be there. They, be, they, they never come to an end. I never run out and I am faithful to you. When you can sing that song when your whole world's falling apart, you're beginning to climb a mountain. You're beginning to live where he wants you to go. Okay, well, I'm done because we're out of time. If there's anyone here tonight uh, that needs prayer, this is what I'd like to ask you to do before you, before you leave. Um, and, and Justin's working on this. We're going to, I think, start having prayer teams on Wednesday night because there are people who come with, with needs. I know that. But before you leave, just, just speak to your neighbor, just somebody around you. Just get them together and in a group of three or four, just pray for one another's needs. Now, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, either do that. Maybe you know some friends that are regular here at the church serving the Lord. Just tell them you want to know the Lord. Or if not, if you can get with me or Justin or, or somebody that looks like an usher or something, get with somebody that seems to know what's going on. And we would love to pray with you and have you know uh, about, about Jesus. Justin, am I, am I re are we ready to dismiss? Okay. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can be called the friend of God. Lord, I, I didn't even talk about it tonight, but th the amazing thing is that you are the one who called us friend. We, Abraham wasn't the friend of God because he was infallible or, or perfect or, or the best of anything. But you, in your sovereign move, you touched his life and Abram responded. Imperfectly, he responded. But you said, I'm going to be your friend, the friend, the friend. Help us to be a friend of God. Not for what that might mean for us, as wonderful as that is, but help us to be the friend of God for what that means to you. May we exist to bring joy to you. May we exist to bring happiness to you. May we exist to worship you. 
May we be a delight to you. May you be so proud of us, although we don't want Job's problems. May, we, may you be so proud of us that in heaven you brag on us like you did Job. May we be a joy to you. May we understand what Jesus understood when a voice from heaven said, this is my child and I am so pleased that he is. Father, can you help us to live in such a way that you can say that about us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now next week, uh, God is going to make some phenomenal promises. And we're going to see Abraham make final preparations for the fulfillment of what he's been waiting for for a quarter of a century. Chapter 17. I love you. God bless you.